Hello. Just wanted to make a quick video about several books that I happen to have on my person. And uh, this is kind of coming from a movie I watched yesterday called Phantom Thread. It's Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis as the main guy. And it had, uh, had many interesting aspects to it. And um, when I was watching the movie, I got feelings of, uh, I thought of the recognitions, I thought of uh, James Joyce, I thought of Kurt Gödel, and it was a very good movie, and uh, I don't want to, I think everyone should watch the movie, but I'm going to go into it a little bit. So, the reason I thought of them is the, the main guy is a fashion designer. Like, basically designs dresses for women. For rich women. In the 1950s. And he's uh, kind of like a prodigy. Because he designed a wedding dress for his mom when he was 16. That's one of the beginning storylines and it made me think of the recognitions because the main character in there is a painter and he's really good when he's young and he is excellent on his own like in his own right and then when he goes to um yeah, it's Paris. It must be Paris to start off with. And he tries to get famous and become a good painter. He gets destroyed by a greedy critic. And then he makes fakes. But I always think of the portrayal of Wyatt in the book. That was very interesting. And, uh, yeah, one thing I've thought about, there's something special about first books. Because some of them are loose, but some of them I think like the recognitions. Now, it may be that I can't see the ways it's not good because I'm younger, but I can't imagine many people reading it not be just thoroughly impressed and able to enjoy it very easily. And I can't say there are a lot of weak parts to it. It all depends what you like, I suppose. But the character of Wyatt really strikes me because the sensitivity he has to things and I was also thinking of when I was watching this movie, Marcel Proust. Because um, one of the things this the character in the movie has is when he eats breakfast, uh, this, this young woman is sitting there with him and wants to talk to him. But he is uh, sitting there with his sketch pad drawing a design and... He says he can't start the day off with confrontation because that will ruin his day. It will ruin the whole rest of his day. And uh, that kind of gave me the feeling of someone like Proust who would, you know, sit away for, for you know, weeks just to write. So uh, one quote that's been on my mind... A lot recently, I'll just go ahead and read it. It's from uh, Spinoza's Ethics, the last page, the last paragraph. If the way I have shown to lead to these things now seems very hard, still it can be found. And of course, what is found so rarely must be hard, 
For if salvation were at hand and could be found without great effort, how could nearly everyone neglect it? But all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. And to follow up with that, I want to read a section from Thomas Brown's Encyclopedia of Common Errors. And uh, this is from chapter 3. Of the second cause of popular errors, the erroneous disposition of the people. Having thus declared the fallible nature of man even from his first production, and have beheld the general cause of error. But as for popular errors, they are more nearly founded upon an erroneous inclination of the people, as being the most deceptible part of mankind, and ready with open arms to receive the encroachments of error. Which conditions of theirs, although deducible from many grounds, yet shall we evidence it but from a few, and such as most nearly and undeniably declare their natures? How unequal discerners of truth they are, and openly exposed unto error, will first appear from their unqualified intellectuals, unable to umpire the difficulty of its dissensions. For error to speak largely is a false judgment of things, or an assent unto falsity. Now whether the object whereunto they deliver up their assent be true or false, they are incompetent judges. For the assured truth of things is derived from the principles of knowledge, and causes which determine their verities. Whereof their uncultivated understandings, scarce holding any theory, they are but bad discerners of verity, and in a numerous track of error, but casually do hit the point and unity of truth. Their understanding is so feeble in the discernment of falsities and averting the errors of reason, that it submitteth unto the fallacies of sense, and is unable to rectify the error of its sensations. Thus the greater part of mankind, having but one eye of sense and reason, conceive the earth far bigger than the sun, the fixed stars lesser than the moon, their figures plain, and their spaces from earth equidistant. For thus their sense informeth them, and herein their reason cannot rectify them, and therefore hopelessly continuing in mistakes, they live and die in their absurdities, passing their days in perverted apprehensions and conceptions of the world, derogatory unto God and the wisdom of the creation. Again, being so illiterate in the point of intellect and their sense so incorrected, they are farther indisposed ever to attain unto truth, as commonly proceeding in those ways which have most reference unto sense, and wherein there lieth most notable and popular delusion. Isn't that perfect? Um, oh, and then I had another thing I wanted to read with... Uh, Section from Tristram Shandy, another excellent book. Pray, sir, in all the reading which you have ever read, did you ever read such a book as Locke's essay upon the human understanding? Don't answer me rashly, because many I know quote the book who have not read it, and many have read it who understand it not. If either of these is your case, as I write to instruct, I will tell you in three words what the book is. It is a history. A history? Of who? What? Where? When? Don't hurry yourself. It is a history book, sir, which may poss possibly recommend it to the world, of what passes in a man's own mind, and if you will say so much of the book, and no more, believe me, you will cut no contemptible figure in a metaphysic circle. But this, by the way, now if you will venture to go along with me and look down into the bottom of this matter, it will be found 
that the cause of obscurity and confusion in the mind of a man is threefold. Dull organs, dear sir, in the first place. Secondly, slight and transient impressions made by the objects when the said organs are not dull. And thirdly, a memory like unto a sieve, which able to retain what it has received. Which, what, what, what did I just read? And thirdly, a memory like unto a sieve, not able to retain what it has received. You'll have to pardon me for that. Call down Dolly, your chambermaid, and I will give you my cap and bell along with it, if I make not this matter so plain that Dolly herself should understand it as well as Malbranch. When Dolly has indicted her epistle to Robin and has thrust her arm into the bottom of her pocket hanging by her right side, take that opportunity to recollect that the organs and faculties of perception can, by nothing in this world, be so aptly typified and explained as by that one thing which Dolly's hand is in search of. Your, organ, your organs are not so dull that I should inform you. Tis an inch, sir, of red seal wax. All right, I think I, I think I shouldn't read any more. I'm messing up too much. But uh, the thing, the reason in the movie I thought of Gödel and Joyce is because they were both very intelligent people, and they both had several picadillos. With Joyce, of course, everyone knows of his fart letters. Um, which I think he would be horrified about. And with Gödel, the interesting thing is he was, of course, uh, a mathematical genius, philosophical genius, but he also married a woman who was a dancer. And uh, Stefan Zweig writes of Vienna in the 1920s, that any man could have a, a dancer for a night for 200, I think, uh, shoot, what did they use? I can't remember what money they used in uh, Vienna at the time. Was it Marks? Shoot, I know that was Germany, but anyway. And uh, I've always thought that was the most interesting thing about Gödel, rather than his philosophical genius or mathematical genius. I would like to understand why he loved her. And he actually died because she got sick and he wouldn't eat food prepared by anyone else. People say because he was feared poison, but I'm not sure if that's it. But I think it's just amazing that you know, someone that intelligent who wrote his completeness and incompleteness theorems when he was 25, he was 25 years old, he died of starvation. And I also always think of his walks with Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Could you imagine what they talked about? Closed, time-like curves. Probably talked about music. And there's a funny uh, anecdote about John von Neumann from the same time that he was at the Institute for Advanced Study and he would always play extremely loud German march music. And it would annoy his fellow, <laughs> I guess, workers, which Einstein was one of them. I think that's so hilarious. And then always, uh, you know, I always go back to that idea of genius. Because it's very, it's very interesting. And I was thinking about uh, 
someone left a comment on one of my recent videos of a friend they had who would walk and have um, very clear images in their head like uh, almost hallucinations and I think that's very interesting hmm. two other books I have here with me that I won't read bits from but I just had them with me and I think they're interesting it's uh, El Criticon by Baltasar Gracian. He's a Spanish writer from the Siglo de Oro, the Golden Age, and um, he published, started publishing this book in 1651, which is also the year of the last edition of this other book I have here with me, The Anatomy of Melancholy by uh, Robert Burton which was first published in 1621 and the last edition was 1651 these are really most of my favorite old books and uh, uh, I probably shouldn't go into this but I will screw it screw it <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of this stuff about female writers and uh, I don't want to take too strong of a stance because I don't really care about it but I did get in an argument on uh, Reddit a couple months back and the argument was basically someone posted an article uh, that uh, female authors are discriminated against and you know this article was written in 2017 that female authors are discriminated against they aren't getting published enough uh, they're being pigeonholed into certain genres um, you know stuff like that like basically ridiculous stuff in today's age and uh, you know their, their main uh, evidence was JK Rowling you know with who published 30 years ago so that's ridiculous you know just a stupid article and I called it a stupid article and um, a woman responded to me asking why I was afraid of women being published more and I thought that was such a stupid thing to say so I said I'm not afraid of women being published more I said, the only thing I'm afraid is of dumb people being published more. <laughs> and I think, you know, of course I was just trying to be provocative, but it's true. Because the thing I care more about, not necessarily dumb or smart people, but good writing being published more. And that seems to me the thing that's prejudiced against. You know, if you pick up a random book, it's very unlikely that it'll be good. Given by the... Uh, quote by Spinoza I read, given by the quote by Thomas Brown I read, given by the current state of the recognitions. I looked at, oh yeah, yeah, what I looked at was, um, so on Goodreads, the recognitions has, I think, like 4,000 reviews, which really doesn't mean anything. But Finnegan's Wake has 10,000, which means even less. And that just baffles me because I was really, I was enjoying, uh, you know, Paperbird's recent video. So it made me pick up Finnegan's Wake and read it a little. And, uh, yeah, I like it, but whatever. I'll probably read it when I'm 60. But I was looking at these reviews of Finnegan's Wake by these dingbats. You know, they didn't understand it at all. You know, they'd be like, uh... I'm really proud that I read it, or I'm proud that I finished it, or they would do a five-star review and say, I, I haven't finished it yet, or I didn't read it, or, uh, you know, read means I'm reading a couple pages every day, and then it makes you ask, well, what's the point of them telling people they've read it if they haven't? What's the point of them reviewing 
Finnegan's Wake on Goodreads. You know, what does that signify? And I don't know, really. I don't know what it signifies. But it's odd. It's very odd. And, uh, yeah, that also reminds me of this introduction to Finnegan's Wake that I have, which is very stupid. <laughs> it's some professor of literature at Berkeley, and he says that Finnegan's Wake may be the best book for a common reader, because you can find every interest in it. Like, uh, maybe someone who's, who, um, isn't Irish may be able to really enjoy the Catholic bits. Or someone who's atheist may really be able to enjoy the, the linguistic puns or something. And it's like, maybe. But you'd have to be extremely delusional to convince yourself that the common reader would be able to enjoy it. And that's what baffled me about there being 10,000 reviews. Which, you know, Goodreads doesn't really mean anything in that way. The reviews are just ridiculous. The only really way you can use them is... If someone you think has good taste, find what other books they like that maybe you haven't read, but yeah, it just really confused me. But I'm in a Shakespeare class now, and I'm really enjoying the, the class, the teacher especially. And he said one very interesting thing. He made a connection between John Milton and Isaac Newton, uh, 1667 was the year that Isaac Newton uh, basically discovered his ideas on gravity, came up with his ideas. And it's also the year that John Milton published Paradise Lost. And uh, the famous anecdote of how Milton, not Milton, but uh, Newton, thought of gravity was an apple falling from a tree. <laughs> it's an interesting connection, isn't it? I, I don't know if uh, that's like a well-known connection, but I had never heard it before. Although I don't know hardly anything about Milton. So maybe it's a common thing among Milton people, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. I love finding those connections. Just like uh, uh, Natalie mentioned uh a book, a booktuber. She had found this, uh, I guess, YA book that mentioned a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, and then this Edgar Allan Poe short story mentioned a novel written in the mid 18th or 19th century about a atheist. And uh, yeah, I love those connections. I really try to make as many of those connections as I can, and because it's just fun. But I don't think they actually mean anything. Hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, I'll end this video now. This was like this was like an especially loose video, but oh well. All right. Uh, I had a friend named Ramblin' Bob. Uh, Death is a Gang Boss 